Okay, good morning, everybody. And it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm extremely pleased to share the podium with my esteemed colleagues here. And for those of you who are interested in water issues of that region, I can't think of two more knowledgeable people. Um, so if you have questions and you don't get them out here today, catch them during the conference, because uh, they know pretty much everything. And, uh, and, and have talked already about some of the bigger picture issues of that region. And I'm going to here drive down a bit and talk about more localized water issues and in particular focus on water for agriculture and focused on use of treated wastewater and gray water for agricultural use in, in the Middle East region. And um, just to explain my work there since uh, the late 2000s um, and continuing, I've been spending quite a bit of time over in the Middle East, learning every time I go, uh, asking lots of questions, sometimes visiting the same place more than once and learning new things each time I'm there, so that um, I, I consider myself a mini-expert on Middle East water. I don't think you can be a real expert unless you're from the region, but um, I know enough to be a little bit dangerous and occasionally correct things that people from the region say, so that makes me a mini-expert. Um, the book was mentioned, Shared Borders, Shared Waters. It's an edited volume that emanated from a workshop we held in Tucson, Arizona back in 2009. And the basic premise of the workshop was that uh, water-scarce regions, stress regions of the world, in arid, semi-arid zones uh, share a lot of commonalities. They share a lot of the same problems and therefore the solutions to the problems have commonalities. And so this particular workshop looked at Israeli-Palestinian water issues and also uh, lower Colorado River Basin issues. And so this collection of papers um, reflects that. And in keeping with um, my work, which I mostly work on water management and policy from a very institutional perspective, I believe that there's transferability of the lessons learned from uh, developing and implementing solutions, sometimes both positive and negative. Um, not everything is even close to perfect, even in places that are looked at as success stories. And I want to mention that in November 2012, I actually took over a, a group of about 10 water professionals um, from the United States to tour in Israel um, a number of the water management features. And that picture there is taken at the Hedera a desalination plant. And the person with the white hard hat and blue shirt is Avram Tenney, who's the director of desalination. Uh, at the Israel Authority, and we were doing a Lahayim toast of the water um, from there with appropriate things probably added back to it by the time we took the drinks of it. I'm not sure. So not knowing exactly what um, Uri and Daron would cover, um, Uri mentioned it quite quickly, and that is Israel makes extensive use of treated wastewater for um, agricultural purposes. And the exact percentages, um, I think it's somewhere close to 60% of uh, the, the water used by agriculture. Maybe it's even higher. It comes from reclaimed uh, water sources. It's a very high percentage. And much of that, not all of that, but much of that comes through a centralized system. And Uri's map, if you looked at it very closely, um, showed the system. I think it was your map. And if you look closely, there was blue pipe and there was purple pipe. And the purple pipe would show the, the system of, of reclaimed water. And, and much of it comes from the Shaftan uh, treatment plant. And after the water is treated to um, good standards, and they're always improving the plants, as happens with wastewater treatment plants, um, it is then recharged. Um, left underground for a while and recovered and put into the purple pipe system. And this happens to be, I, I couldn't resist putting it here, this is one of my favorite slides to use in presentations in Arizona or the Southwest and whatever. And I show these slides of these basins and I'm giving you a hint of the answer and I say, where do you think these are? 
because you see basins, you see Coca-Cola, you see Ikea. So people say, Phoenix, we've got an Ikea south of Phoenix and whatever. But no, that's right near the Shafta and treatment facility. You can see the Ikea sign in Hebrew on the other side of the sign. The point being that you could look at recharge basins, you look at pro programs of underground storage and soil aquifer treatment, they're similar around the world. Um, and Ikea is all over the world too. I have a China Ikea sign too. I haven't figured out how to get that into one of my presentations. Um, and also, how we talk about these things and how we use them as, as uh, learning opportunities for people are also very similar. On your left are, um, the, the, it's actually made of stone. These are some um, interpretive information, educational information signs by those uh, basins near the Shafdan. And I was talking with some Tucson water people one time. We go out to the Sweetwater Wetlands, which does some wetland treatment, and then recharge um, in a basin like that of treated wastewater. And there are the interpretive signs up there. And they're the same thing. They're just different language showing what's going on um, with the using the soils to treat, um, uh, recharging the aquifers, and then recovering the water for delivery through a purple pipe system. One of the major differences in our region of Tucson and in Israel is that the water through the purple pipe in our region tends to get delivered to golf courses, playing fields, you know, school grounds uh, for, for turf irrigation as opposed to being used for agriculture. We do have some reuse for agriculture um, in the Phoenix area, but not um, the primary reuse we do is really for more municipal and industrial purposes. We uh, cool a wastewater, I mean a nuclear power plant with uh, treated wastewater. So now to get to the, the main focal point of my presentation is the, the I want to talk about two cases of decentralized reuse, um, one of treated wastewater, one of gray water, um, and in the context, I want to talk about some of the issues dealt with in the regions and, and talk a little bit about some of the characteristics. So the one is um, in Israel, that's uh, the yellow, the red dot. I guess there is a, um, I don't know, it's too hard to see where this is pointing. But where the red dot is on your left, uh, east of Netanya, is the area that I'm going to talk about that's using uh, what I'd say decentralized, smaller scale treated wastewater. And then my other case on gray water is in, in Jordan, in the Jordan Valley. Um, and the, the Israeli case of treated wastewater is in an area called Emek Hefer on the Israel side. On the West Bank side is Tolkarim. And a little bit further away is the city of Nogales. And there's treatment going on that is, is an example of trans-border cooperation. And the, the signs, which may be a little hard to read um, on my screen here, a little easier up there, is cooperation between Emma Keffer and the Tulkarim area for a solution to the environmental problems. And it shows a, a diagram. There's a whole series of placards. But basically what's going on there is that the, the wastewater from Tulkarim is being treated on the Israel side, and then the the, um, I, I would think it's secondary treated effluent is being used to irrigate trees for agricultural purposes on the Israel side. Now what's very interesting to me, and sometimes you visit things and it just really makes an indelible mark um, in your mind, and I, I took my, I visited this first in November 2011, and then in November 2012 took my water management group, my tour group, um, there to visit it as well, because what's really striking is, are the environmental implications of what's going on in that region. And that is, on your right is the basically the aeration ponds after treatment for the secondary treated effluent. You can see ducks in there and it doesn't smell and, or anything. To your left, which is literally just steps away, is just an aeration pond. All they're doing is just feeding some raw sewage coming from Nablus into these pines. It's foamy, it's smelly, there are no ducks, and then that gets discharged, and it's a major environmental issue. Now, I've checked recently, um, they have built, I believe, a treatment plant in Nablus that has cut down on the discharge of, of raw sewage, um, and this goes, um, 
then flowing into Israel downstream, but this still is a problem. There's also a problem of black gunk around the outskirts of it that has to do with the olive processing and so forth. And so you have some really uh, major environmental issues that are yet to be dealt with. So while we talk about the transborder cooperation in Daron's example here, where he showed the, the gentleman, I think it was all gentlemen in the room, um, discussing it in meeting, um, meetings like that happen, but they don't necessarily happen that frequently, and they don't necessarily happen, um, I'll refer back to, to Kelly's presentation for those of you who are there where you want to get people in the room or here. These are meetings held talking about U.S.-Mexico border issues. Um, you can cross borders. We even have a border fence, a border wall in, in, in Arizona, between Arizona and the state of Sonora. But there's still ready transport. And just one of the points I want to make here is that some of the collaboration is made very difficult by the political issues. And those two signs I show of the Palestinian Water Authority in Ramallah and then the Israel Water Authority a plaque outside their building in Tel Aviv were taken by me in March 2012 on two consecutive days. Um, you'd be hard pressed to find an Israeli who would actually be able to do that because Israelis can't go into Ramallah. Um, and Palestinians can go into Israel, but the passage isn't that easy. So I want to make a point here just about uh, border cooperation really, um, I think, requires ready um, exchange of, 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 of ideas and conversation through people face to face, and that can be difficult in that area. Nonetheless, some good collaboration is going on. I want to switch gears now and talk briefly about the pilot gray water system in uh, the Jordan Valley. And this was an opportunity that kind of came out of the blue for me in, um, in the early part of 2011. And I've made multiple trips to um, that region in Amman. And the idea here um, is, many of you may know, Jordan is the third or four, fourth most water stressed um, country in the world. And with the influx of Syrian refugees, it might be, you know, three or two now, um, because they have very severe water problems. And agriculture is the major consumer of water um, on, a, on a sectoral basis. And the idea is uh, a localized approach to gray water use might be able to alleviate some of the water problem there. So my colleagues, and their names are there at the bottom of, of, of the screen from the Royal Scientific Society in Amman, um, have an idea of developing a filtration system. I'll show you some pictures in just a, a moment, where instead of um, the water going to, in these areas, they're not sewer connected. This is a rural area of farming with houses around it. The water, the wastewater is discharged into cesspools. Instead of having all that water go into to cesspools, they would take the shower water and, and some of the kitchen water and, and put it in through a gray water filtration system. And there again, just to give you a sense of the lay of the land, very arid, heavily agricultural, um, lots of huts with growing crops and crops in between. And you can see at the bottom, the people get delivery of water. My understanding is that water is a mix of treated wastewater and surface water that's delivered to there. They have these holding ponds um, that they use for irrigation. And the idea would be to take water from a house, um, in this case it's a series of four houses, uh, put it through a, a filtration system where the filters are made with local materials, um, send it up into, um, with some ultraviolet filtration, and then have it used and supplement the irrigation water and put in one of those holding ponds. And you can see this uh, solar panel is used to pump the water up to the uh, ultraviolet filtration. And there's the man whose house it's on and, and his youngest son there. And what was actually amazing to me is how quickly um, the, the primary, uh, the principal investigators got this program installed, uh, a project installed and running. And so it's a pilot project. Uh, USAID had uh, some uh, funding offered for the first phase. And the idea would be to get it running, test the water, 
and then hopefully um, scale it up for further use. <coughs> we published a paper, one of the elements of the project was they did a household survey, they went into households, conducted surveys on people's attitudes toward gray water. People get deliveries of water there about once a week. They hold it in storage tanks in their homes. Many of them buy it from commercial truckers. They pay quite a bit of money. If you look at the percentage of the income going for water compared to, let's say, here in the US, it can be quite high. The survey results show they're very low income, but people, people are willing to accept the reuse of water, gray water, and um, the importance of education so people understand what it means to use this water. And so um, the initial results are encouraging. The, the filter system has been working, not without some uh, need for some replacement of some of the filtration uh, materials. We've been uh, working together since that time. We have a second paper out on, uh, to be out very soon on the initial water quality results. And the initial water quality results are very good, um, that the water quality is better than what they would otherwise be using. And so there are a lot of benefits to this, but definitely can draw major conclusions based on this pilot project. So uh, additional work to be done, and particularly challenging is finding funding sources that are willing to fund, let's say, a collaborative of US researchers and Jordanian researchers. Um, it's, it's not an easy task to find pe uh, you know, NSF will fund US people, but not necessarily Jordanian and like. In closing, I wanted to mention one other source uh, or, of water, and, and um, I think uh, Ori or Doron mentioned um, uh, desalinated uh, brackish groundwater. That's a, a, another area where Israel's uh, really a leader in that. They've, they've built a few plants. This happens to be uh, down near the Egyptian border where there are major uh, production facilities, covered production facilities for uh, cherry tomatoes in particular. And I just wanted to share with you that um, I've been told, I'm not an expert on this, that the, one of the reasons why the cherry tomatoes are so good there, which they, I can not tell you I'm an expert that the cherry tomatoes are good, but that the, the water sometimes used for those plants is, has high salinity. It's, it's a higher salinity water, and that's contributed some to that. But at the, at the southern end um, of our more southern part of the country, there's a desalination plant where they're not close enough to uh, discharge the brine to any sea, and that's a uh, an evaporation pond from the, from the brine, beautiful sunset picture that um, I made the bus stop so I could get out and take it. But I did want to mention, you know, I've, I've talked about effluent, I've talked about um, gray water, um, some brackish water may be used, um, some desalinated uh, brackish water may be mixed with other sources. And there, there is a mix of water being used for agriculture in the area. In some areas, they're actually using pumped water, fresh water, uh, uh, blue, green water, whatever. So with that, I want to say thank you. I just want to note, if anybody's interested in any other presentations or things, we just actually created on our website a Middle East water page under our research and programs. And so you can find a lot of information there. So thank you very much. <laughs>